So um, with that further ado, let me give you Bronson Anderson. Bronson. Hey guys, um, thanks for attending tonight. Um, I'm looking at the numbers and we're up to 80. So this is, um, I was talking to my farmer friend and neighbor earlier today and he was talking about his bumper crop and it looks like we have a, a bumper attendance here. So this is amazing. Um, so um, again, as I said before, thank you for coming and um, and sharing this experience with me and my and, and, and allowing me to share my love for log homes. Um, I presented this this particular program to the St. Louis chapter uh, earlier this month or earlier that last month, um, and uh, and and they enjoyed it. And I was able to do two hours, so that's why we kind of broke it up. It's a two-hour program, uh, and um, so we only had an hour the first time. We only have an hour this time. So um, the class overview, I talked about the history of the log home. I talked about our value, log profiles, terminology of the log home, um, insects, moisture. Um, but I think we're going to kind of um, backtrack just a little bit for those that weren't there for the, for the last presentation. And uh, we're going to go to the terminology of logs um, because this is very important when you're calling it out uh, in your reports. If you do a log home inspection, uh, you want to know exactly what you're calling out and what what to say in your report. Uh, so we'll go right into it. So um, a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people that are, are calling out things uh, incorrectly on log homes is the terminology and shinking is one of those. Um, they might think that it's a derogatory term. It really isn't. Um, it's used uh, freely in the, the log home industry. Uh, but chinking is that is that uh, material that fills the space or the gap between logs. Um, and depending on the, the log profile and the joinery at the logs, it is dependent on how much space is is there in between. And so the top picture has an older log home built in the 1700s. And the bottom picture is um, actually the link that I took from permachink.com. Um, and those are those are a very small uh, opening between the logs. And so depending on the opening, it depends on the material that is used. Um, older material used for, for chinking was a mortar base. Um, and they used to mix in straw, horse hair, pig hair, depending on the region. Uh, mud, and they would mix all that together, pack it in, into the opening. Some people, or some some areas actually used um, uh, moss to do that. When I, I first built my first log cabin um, back in the late 80s, when I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, uh, we, me and my best friend Chris built a trapper shack out of logs, and um, and we used moss and mud. And so it worked quite well, it insulated really well. Um, but uh, nowadays they use a synthetic type of, of chinking um, and permachink.com. Go ahead and, and write that that link down, that that uh, that address down. Permachink.com. They have all the materials that you need uh, in the event that you see something going on at a, at a log home. They're going to be the 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 premier go-to site for any material used to repair, fix, maintain a log home. Um, Checking. Checking is the natural cracks in the wood, uh, whether these are vertical, horizontal, upward facing, downward facing, um, at the end, the bottom of the log. Uh, these are normal, common characteristics. Um, some of these checks or cracks can be very large and some of them can be very small. And depending on where the, the check uh, originates in the log face itself or the log end, that is, is dependent on where you want to spend more time. Um, upward facing, and we'll get a little more into that, upward facing uh, checks or cracks are where you're going to want to spend more time than at the bottom run or the bottom row of the, of the log. And I'm going really quick into this because we have more to cover. Uh, the kerf, you generally don't see a kerf. The kerf is, is cut at the length of the log, uh, generally at the bottom side of the log, so you don't see it. Uh, and water doesn't sit in it, and it's there to prevent, prevent the log from checking. It's, it's kind of like the expansion joints or control joints in, in, in con, uh, concrete um, in a sidewalk or a large patio. They cut those little lines in there so that when the, the concrete contracts, it cracks in those without cracking everywhere else. Well, a curve is 
basically designed to do that. Although, as we all know, wood's going to crack wherever it wants to. Um, this is kind of trying to control that. And instead of calling the on, on a normal house, we call it the 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 house envelope. Uh, but in log construction, we call it the log shell. And that's the outermost four walls that uh, that hold out the the um, the elements, but also create the structural factor of the house. Um, this is what we call the log shell. Um, so a little bit different, but um, I mean, you could probably still call it the building envelope in your report, but really it's called a log shell when you're inspecting log homes. Um, the tongue and groove. So most manufacturer ma manufactured log homes have a tongue and groove. Um, you can see the bottom part, uh, the bottom picture there, you see a tongue and groove kind of fits together like uh, like Legos, but you'll see a slit cut in the bottom uh, of that log. That's the kerf. Um, that's that long uh, cut or notch that's cut in log homes to kind of keep them from splitting where they want to. Um, you, again, you normally don't see that unless it's cut in and you're going to see those at the log, log end joineries. So that's the common terminology of logs. Um, so we're going to go into corner uh, notching. And so these were these are where the logs intersect and um, and kind of come together and it actually creates the the stronger part of that wall. Um, if anybody's ever played with Lincoln logs, that's where the two logs kind of fit together. Uh, and we'll go over actually what type of of uh, saddle no or, or notch that we we use for that. Um, so a button pass is a type of, of joinery that's used at the at the at the logs, and it's one of the most common. Uh, log joineries that you're going to see for kit style log homes. Um, and we'll go ahead and get to a picture. So this is a button pass uh, type of joinery. And you can see one log goes further and then the adjacent log stops at that adjoining log. And so you can see a little diagram here. B stretches over at the top and C butts up against B. And so that's a standard uh, button pass joinery. And so we have a saddle notch. Uh, saddle notch is very common. Saddle notch is what was basically used in the old days. It was easy. It was an easy type of joinery uh, to get a, a axe and, um, and, and cut those out. The deeper the saddle, the closer those, those logs fit together, which in, then in turn, you don't have to put as much chinking material in between the logs. Um, you can see the top picture there has uh, some backer rod that gets placed into the um, the the TNJ the TNG there, um, and that basically uh, creates an, a watertight seal. Those do break down over time, but it takes a long time to do that uh, when they're sealed. A lot of uh, log home contractors will put a, a bead of caulk in between that TNJ TNG as well. Uh, but that's basically what a saddle notch joinery or corner looks like. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Now this is my favorite. It takes a, it takes uh, a little more work to do. Uh, it's more expensive to fix if you ever had a, a, a repair at the log end, but this is a dovetail and it looks just like it sounds. Uh, but they actually have to put a jig on each log and create that dovetail look. Uh, and once they do it, they fit together and they do not move from side to side. So you don't get any lateral force or lateral movement from side to side. It's considered the most, um, it, it's, it's the most, um, or, or the strongest type of, uh, of joinery that you can have. Um, and these are, you're, you're going to see the, these type of joineries on H logs, uh, or square logs or D logs. You're not going to see this type of joinery on a round log where it's round on both sides. As in the picture, that's a round log. And these are uh, interlocking corners. Interlocking corners are, um, if you ever played with Lincoln logs, this is the type of joinery that you would have. Um, it's, it's one of the hardest type to get correct and get even. Um, and most of these are, are most of this joinery is, is performed at the factory. Uh, and not by hand on site. And so a vertical post or a corner post, uh, this is the le this is not the strongest, this is the least strong uh, way of, of joining logs together, uh, but it looks it looks nice and tidy. It looks great. 
um, they fit into a little a, a little a little groove there. The logs do, and they normally run a dowel rod in into the end of that log um, via that that corner post. Um, and again, those logs can move away, uh, and it's not necessarily the strongest, but it does look nice and tidy. A lot of these posts that you see like this, you normally don't see it on a log home because when they do a, 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 a method like this, they end up putting siding uh, on the outside of the log, so you actually don't even see the logs at all. And so this is a little diagram on what types of type of logs work. Um, at the top, you can see the log profile, um, the 8x12, 6x12, it really doesn't matter as much. Uh, but the log profiles do. So the first, the first two are H's, the, the second two are D's, um, and then you have the two round. Um, some people call those double D's when it's round on both sides. Um, and then dovetail, saddle notch, mortise and tenon, um, which is a button pass, um, and then a corner post. And so that's kind of, kind of what you want to look for. If you know that the log ends were performed on site, um, and fashioned on site, you want to make sure you go back to this diagram to make sure that the, the, the uh, joinery matches the log profile. It's very important. And so moisture, this leads us to moisture. This is one of the, the biggest uh, culprits other than uh, wood destroying insects that um, is, is a big issue for log homes. Um, it's the biggest threat to log homes. Uh, because they're built of wood and, and, and logs themselves have a natural capillary effect uh, when they're introduced to water. And I don't care how long the log has, has been felled uh, and chopped down. Um, I've seen logs that uh, are, were 200 years or, or 200 plus years and they still maintain that same capillary effect that they did when they were first cut down. And so um, we're, we're going to kind of discuss where to look for uh, moisture penetrations within logs and where you should spend most of your time. Um, and as I state, log ends are where you basically want to spend the vast majority of your time when inspecting for moisture within a log home. Um, windows are a very common area. Windows sometimes, if, if it's not a kit style home, uh, windows can be a natural uh, point of, of moisture penetration. And the reason for that is because if it's not a kit style home, Basically, in order to cut a window, they take a chainsaw, they cut out the size of, of the window opening, and they slap a window in. Um, but when, when you look at window penetrations, you're going to want to look at the, uh, the butt joints around the window. You're going to want to look at the, um, the window stool definitely below the window, uh, and, and most certainly windows that, that are in the line or path of wind-driven rain. So if you know that most of the storms originate from the west, to the east, um, or um, and, and you know that storms are going to be uh, blowing wind or blowing uh, rain towards the house, that's where you're going to want to look. Uh, but you're going to see these kind of blackish, orangish streaks around and below or above the window, and you're going to want to report on that. Now, I use a moisture meter with a probe on it, um, and we'll get on we'll get over those tools as well and kind of give you some some links on those. Um, but I use a moisture meter and it doesn't necessarily mean if it tests dry, it's, it's not going to get moist again. Uh, you're going to want to report on every little bit of moisture that you see because they will give you a call back. Um, uh, dormers. Dormers on uh, log homes are kind of one of those things where it's, it's, it's an afterthought. So they want to add more, more, um, more space to the log home upstairs or in the loft area. So they add a dormer. Unfortunately, they either A, don't splash it right, or B, they don't put gutters. And so when you don't put gutters up, it splashes right on the roof surface. Um, and that splashback effect causes rot at that, that junction area between the roof and the log home. And as you can see here, uh, this is actually a Swedish cope style um, uh, log. And so it has a half moon on the bottom. So you see the original log, you see there's two or three logs new logs that they're getting ready to replace, but you see those the older in-place logs. So you see a, a tongue and groove on those older logs, but you don't see it on the new logs. So if you're if you're looking at a reinspection and you're looking at the log ends and you look at the replacement log ends, you don't see the log, it doesn't match the old log, then it's done incorrectly. So you're gonna wanna look at that, um, 
want to look at these logins. Now, I sent these logs back because they're not going to join and fit correctly to the original structure. And when they don't, you're going to get a moisture penetration. Um, and so they can't just cut a tongue of groove in there because that shortened or, or decreases the diameter of the log. Um, so they had to send it all back. Unfortunately, by creating that tongue and groove, that that was, um, I think that was another two or three hundred dollars per log to to replace. Um, so that increased the the bit of that that repair. Um, again, this is a butt joint, um, and you can see the moisture dripping from that butt joint. It's turned black in in color. Um, this is pretty easy to spot. Sometimes to hide these, they'll go in and and um, and really use a dark stain on the interior of the, of the house. Um, and you're gonna see the smoke more interior than exterior, but they'll use a dark stain and, um, and that's, that's what you're gonna look for. So if you don't see moisture, use a moisture meter, probe in that area, um, but butt joints are, are, are easy, easy places for moisture to come in. And the reason for that is because they don't have the tongue of groove to protect them, and they generally don't have the backer rod there. So they, they rely on caulking and, and shaking on the outside, which most um, most homeowners do not keep up regularly with their, their home maintenance outside. Hey, Bronson. Yep. There's a question on that last one. Um, it says, what is the plywood in this picture? Did you have one that, that had plywood in it? Um, I don't remember seeing one with plywood. Okay. Go back to the um, dormer picture there, Bronson. I think there was plywood on the wall of the dormer. Right there. Isn't that plywood? Uh, no, no, maybe it's, that's not. That's that's a tongue and groove. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only thing I saw that looked like plywood. Okay. Yeah, that's a tongue and groove, and they use that tongue and groove there at the connections in order to fashion a piece of, of flashing there. Um, that's a great question, and um, I'm glad you guys uh, said something about that. In order to, you can't just put flashing up against the uh, a round log like that, or any log for that matter, and expect it to hold. So what they'll do is, is put a, um, some some tongue and groove there. Um, they did a little bit of house wrap. This is a, a house built in the 70s, um, and then they'll put they'll fashion a piece of flashing up underneath that, and then draw the logs on top of that. Um, you normally don't see this on on log home construction in, unless you you have a dormer. I'm glad you said something. I don't know who that was, but thumbs up. Um, Logins are a high priority, and this is where you should spend the vast majority of your time outside. I know Sean Troxel uh, came with me on an on a log home inspection in Southern Virginia, and um, we spent a, a a great deal of time on the logins. And I take a look at every single login that I could see and get to, um, and that's where I'm, I spend most of my time because again, that capillary effect in the log is what draws that moisture into it. Um, and I've seen a, a small amount of, of moisture and rot at the log end transfer itself all the way to the center of the log. And then it transfers from the log end to the, to the run of the log. Um, and then it becomes a, a, a very big issue. So log ends where the joinery meets, uh, that's where it, it's exposed to the elements. Uh, most people do not uh, seal those areas and caulk those areas properly. Uh, therefore, that capillary effect of the log draws the moisture in, causing rot, causing rot. And so here is a uh, a nice example of a saddle notch uh, with a Swedish cope uh, cut, and you can see you can see mushrooms. Um, the the log has drawn that moisture all the way in, and it's actually gone all the way to the notch itself. That entire wall had to be replaced. And when you're looking at, uh, here's another one. This is a um, um, a dovetail joinery on a square log, and the the rot. You can see where the log in drew it in from the from this log in here, and it drew it all the way in to the center of the log and and beyond. That entire section has to be etched out. If they can't salvage more than 70% of the log, then the whole log will have to be taken out and and then replaced. Um, a, just to give you an example, a dovetail like this with a four foot section is about six to seven hundred dollars to repair per log. And that's that's regionally. That's in Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland. That's going to be the average figure here now. 
there are areas that are going to be much more expensive than that. Um, you can see here where the log ends. This is a a um, this is a, a cabin that was built, I think, in the 60s, um, where it's an uneven style uh, joinery at the end. Uh, the overhang of those logs, you get more more damage and more exposure to the elements in the water. Therefore, they're going to rot. Unfortunately, it went way too far. This this uh, particular excuse me this particular home um, had enormous structural uh, deflection and defects, and um, both strong walls had to be replaced. I think this one from it, this was not part of my inspection. This was another person that I know. I think this cost upwards of one hundred and seventy thousand dollars to fix. Um, that's what moisture does for a log home. Uh, where decks or patios come, in, come into contact with the log wall itself or at the bottom run of the log wall. So most log homes, you're not going to see uh, gutters and downspouts, and so you'll get that splashback. Um, adding gravel is great. Uh, adding a trough is great, but a lot of times you'll get that splashback. So you'll, you're going to look for rot at that very first row. Uh, of logs towards the foundation, but you're also going to look for for uh, moisture and rot anywhere where there's a deck or a patio that is is uh, up against those log walls. Uh, lack of kickout slashing. I see this very often on normal stick built houses. Um, kickout slashing is a is a big issue when it comes to log homes. Uh, the lack of kickout flashing can cause some major, major issues. Uh, surface, surface erosion is the first thing that happens. Once you get surface erosion, it just it, it adds a highway for moisture to enter the center of the log. Once that happens, then um, it's only a matter of a short time with this with with pine where it just rots away. Uh, once stru that structural movement begins, then you have issues all throughout that wall. So here's a prime example of missing kickout flashing. You could see the actual flow of water against the surface of the log home. Um, in a short amount of time, this is going to this is going to cause some issues. Now, when you call this out for for uh, kickout flashing, you're going to want to also take note that there isn't any gutters. So you might want to ask them to add some gutters. Um, but also that area that has been compromised is lacking stain and sealant. Um, so you're going to want to go ahead and, and tell them that stain and sealant need to be reapplied. Uh, do not use a, a pressure washer. Do not use a water pressure washer to clean this. There are other methods. Uh, Permachink has a, a great, a great um, resource for that. Um, and we'll go over that. I think that might have been that might have been step one or, or part one. So if you get the recording, look at part one. We'll go over that. Um, this is a house that I was involved in. Uh, I went back on the notes on this house and I gave some false information. All of the issues with this house, including moisture and log repairs, uh, the, the total estimate cost was $215,000 to fix um, this entire house and all the, all the issues. But um, I am actually standing on the porch looking at the, the uh, soffit overhang and a lack of kickout flashing. I could see daylight from the living room uh, through these logs, it was just completely compromised. Um, each one of these logs, like this, uh, cost eight hundred dollars to fix for one log. Hey, Bronson, how yep. how would how would they support the logs uh, above when they're replacing damage like that? Yeah, it's a good question. So what they do is they they put in a notch. So they bring the log back to as far as they can. They'll put in a notch and they'll put a little jack in. Um, it's similar to when they put it, they fell a tree. If you're trying to fell a tree, I don't know if anybody has, has ever, has ever been versed in chainsaw. So when I, when I cut a notch in the, in the back end of a tree and then, and then go to cut my biscuit, um, I put a notch in there and then I'll put a jack on the back end of that tree so I can actually fell that tree the direction that I want to. Well, they do the, basically the same thing here. So they're going to notch out that one section of the log. Uh, the best they can, and then they'll put a jack in between that section. Is that going to answer it? Hope. <laughs> um, that's a great question. 
I've seen contractors screw this up, and when they put that jack in, they'll actually lift the, the structure uh, of this uh, load bearing wall, log wall set, uh, and it actually compromises the, the structural integrity of the log home, even though they were trying to fix it. So, again, this is something that's why it takes so much uh, money to fix these because it's, it's very labor intensive to fix these logs. Um, and consequently, when they join logs like that, they normally do not put, um, they normally do not go back with wood dowel rods in order to join the top and the bottom log to the center. Um, they'll go in with, with uh, stainless steel spikes normally, or aluminum spikes, something that will not rust or deteriorate or expand or contract very greatly. Um, it's another example of what will happen with, without kickout flashing. Uh, this was actually on the back side of the house and um, and unfortunately this is this was about six to seven feet from the log end so that log section will have to be cut out when it has to be cut out like that and you put a new log in it stands out like a sore thumb you end up having to 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 stain the entire log uh, log home a dark stain so that's moisture moisture is a big big issue uh, but which leads me to the next section wood destroying insects insects are, are a big issue when it comes to log homes and, and the reason for that is because the log structure is wood um, wood destroying insects love wood uh, you can't get a, get rid of oxygen you can't get rid of of uh, the, the the food source but oftentimes we can get rid of the, the water source and so if there's not a ready water source for for insects um, then they're not necessarily going to be ready to go there however uh, some of the most common uh, ones that you see on a log home are powder post beetles, carpenter ants, termites, and carpenter bees. Um, most people have seen most most of these these types of insects. Those are the most common that you're going to see, and we'll go ahead and start with powder post beetles. The powder post beetles will leave this kind of little bitty tiny pinhead pinhead hole. Um, and dust will fall, fall out of that. that. That's the frass. The frass will fall out of that. Um, you normally see an indication of current activity when you tap on that. That's that's why I bring a, um, a screwdriver or um, a rubber mallet with me on my inspections. I'll tap on that if I suspect um, some, some current activity with these powder post beetles. I'm not tapping on it hard enough to cause dimples in the wood, but you'll actually see frass coming out. If you see frass coming out, chances are it, it's it's a pretty active uh, infestation. Um, active infestations with a log home, sometimes they can surface treat, but if it's gone too far, then they're gonna have to actually tent the entire log home. Depending on the size of the log home, uh, that depends on how much, how much uh, money it's gonna cost to tent and eradicate. Um, that's what a powder post beetle looks like. They're very, very tiny. Um, and there's the frass. I know this is a kind of a grainy picture, but that's the frass that uh, kind of comes out of those holes with powder post beetles. Um, and that's just a size comparison, the holes that you see versus a, a uh, pencil. So very tiny. Some people like that, that look, the characteristic of it. Um, so we're going to go through uh, carpenter ants. Uh, most people have seen carpenter ants, even people that don't know what they are, they've seen them anyways. They're gigantic black ants, um, and they have large mandibles. So their mandible, their head, thorax, and abdomen. The thorax is going to be small, their abdomen, abdomen is going to be large, but their, their head is going to be huge. So you'll see the workers and the, the, um, the, um, the scouts will have those big, large mandibles on the top, on the, on their head. Um, and they, they leave kind of a, a larger uh, hole and uh, tunnels in the wood. Um, I put a penny there to show you what one looks like, but that's kind of what you're gonna wanna look for on these, and you'll see them throughout. Um, if, the, if the house has been recently treated, you'll see these dead all over the place, either in a crawl space, basement, a window stool, um, you'll see these guys. They will migrate. Um, by that time you see ants with wings, you're in trouble. <laughs> So, um, so these are these are carpenter uh, carpenter bees. So carpenter bees, they look like a bumblebee. Um, they're they they bore kind of a um, 
I don't know, half inch hole, three quarter, well, maybe a three quarter inch hole. They, they drill a, a perfectly round hole and they'll go up about an inch and then they'll take a, they'll take a button hook to the right and then they'll lay their larva. Um, the problem with this is when woodpeckers are, are attaching, are, are looking for this larva, they'll actually etch out that, um, that chamber, that nest chamber looking for that larva. And that's what causes a great number of, of damage um, and opens up the log home for moisture penetration. And once that happens, um, that moisture gets trapped in those, in those, uh, those holes left and it starts to rot very quickly. Um, this is a picture of a female uh, carpenter bee, and you know it's female because it's got that little white patch on it. They're kind of furry versus a bumblebee is more shiny. Um, these particular bees do not have stingers, uh, so you can grab them, you can swat them. I give my son a, um, a badminton racket, and I tell him I'll give you a dollar for every one of these you swat and kill, um, because all they're gonna do is cause damage. Um, they will try to, they, even though they, they, they bore into a log, uh, a log or, or wood for that matter, any wood, they are lazy, so they will try to come back to the same hole. Um, how to detour, deter these, I don't know if I have, there's there are some, um, you see the top end of that log here, there has a, uh, has a, a perfectly round pole, and then the bottom section there, that's where the woodpecker is on in looking for that larva. Um, so I do not have that. So, um, so how does this tour these? So carpenter bees, they, they fly onto a piece of wood and they're searching for the grain of the wood, the soft part of that wood. And so um, that's the soft part of the wood where you can actually stick your fingernail in it and leave a mark with your fingernail. That's what they're searching for. So they're feeling for that. Um, and so a lot of times what they'll do, what uh, companies will do and what I do on, on my wood trim around my house is put a little bit of shellac on the base of, of, of my wood railing, uh, wood soffit. And when they're feeling for that soft wood, they feel that shellac and they move somewhere else because they don't want to bore through shellac, they think it's something else. Um, so that's a number of things. There are uh, over-the-counter uh, traps that you can use for carpenter bees and they work quite well. Um, go on YouTube, you can actually make homemade carpenter bee traps. Um, and there's a number of different designs out there. Uh, longhorn beetles, um, you don't really see these very often. Uh, these generally hatch or emerge uh, pretty quickly after the, after the tree has been felled. Um, if you have a dead standing tree or, or uh, a, uh, a green log home, um, you're gonna wanna look for these. Um, normally, they'll try to treat the logs on a surface level, but they will have to tent if the infestation is too large. And so that's kind of what a longhorn beetle looks like. Um, and that's the frass. The frass is very, um, very thick and the striations of the frass is, is kind, of, kind of similar to that of a uh, carpenter ant. And another example, termites, everybody, most people that have been in home inspections for a number of years have seen a termite. Um, I don't know why this picture is turning up grainy. I do apologize, but um, the queen is very large. You normally don't see that. You normally see the worker soldiers. Uh, once you see termites with wings, you have an infestation. They're trying to migrate from place to place um, and set up shop somewhere else. Um, once it's gone to that, that level, then most certainly call it out. Um, so termites are generally associated with moisture. So uh, look for log ends or areas where the, the gutters or downspouts are missing and you get that splashback effect. So every time it rains, um, that moisture gets kicked up onto the, the log home, shaded areas of the log home. So if you're looking for, um, looking for moisture uh, or looking for wood destroying insects, areas of the log home that get more shade retain more moisture over time. Um, it's like ringing the dinner bell for any wood destroying insect. So concentrate your time on those shaded areas of the log home. So those are insects. There's uh, many more insects that you really don't have to worry about that are, are part of this, but um, those are the main insects that you're gonna look at. Um, and so, oh, basic tools. So, um, Basic tools for the, the log home inspection, 
most people have these tools in, in their, their arsenal when they're inspecting regular stick built homes, but we're gonna go through a few that I use and why I use them. So the moisture meter. Um, I use a moisture meter and I use, it, I use the probes a lot on log home inspections um, so that I can get deeper in. So if I see a check, uh, which is the crack, and it's a larger check, and it's the upward facing check, um, then I'm gonna stick that probe down. And now again, I'm not causing any damage to the log, but I wanna stick that, that probe down as far as I can to the center of the log. That's where the moisture is gonna be re retained and the, the rot is going to occur. Um, it's similar to a log that, it, or, or, or a tree that is, is uh, still alive and you cut it and it's rotten in the center. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, I'm trying to get to that center of the log. And it tells me a lot. And I, I personally use the Predimeter uh, Timber Master um, on my log home inspections. I use a three foot level. Uh, three foot level is the basic level that you should use. You should not use anything any smaller than a three foot level. I go between a three foot to a four foot, depending on where I need to use it in the home. Um, but I often use a three foot level to evaluate lateral movement uh, or horizontal movement in, in a load bearing wall of a log home. And I'm gonna try to get to, if we have time, let's see what time we have, it's 2107. So we've got a little bit of time. Um, and so, I use a three-foot level in those those load-bearing walls, um, and it basically tells me if there's been a shift from a lateral standpoint uh, in those load-bearing walls, and, and it allows me to actually take a picture of it and, and show in the report how much movement has, has taken place. Um, I also carry a plumb bob, plumb bob if I see significant movement, then I hang a plumb, plumb bob at the top of the wall to, to actually demonstrate that movement. Um, it's very it's very important that you document all of these things in your report with lots of great great pictures, clear pictures, concise pictures, and make sure that those pictures have captions. Um, a flashlight, um, I use the Phoenix. Um, Phoenix makes a, a lot of different uh, types of flashlights and uh, lumens. I use one that has a thousand lumens. Um, I don't normally kick it on to a thousand lumens very often on my inspections of log homes. But I'm really trying to get to 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 shine um, as much light as possible in those checks, those cracks, either in the log in or in the field of the log. Um, I want to get as much light as possible uh, to see if there's any rot or any potential rot that that is not necessarily visible normally. Um, again, some of these these are mostly tools that you use in your in your your day to day stick built inspections. Um, a roll of masking tape. I get laughs every time I bring out a, a roll of masking tape and I get questions all the time, but a, a, this is a simple test. It's called a lift test. Um, and it's to, to try to take a sample of, of the actual finish, the, the, um, the sealant, the finish of the log itself. So when a log, a log wall gets on the outside of the log, it, it gets weathered, that finish either will start to chip off um, or this color, um, but the, an easy way to do this is just take a little bit of, of, of masking tape. I use blue painter's tape, that's why it's in the picture, um, and you just take off a little, little bit of that, you stick it to the log home on the outside of the log home, and if finish comes off with the tape, which it shouldn't, um, then they, you, you might wanna call for uh, refinishing the surface, the exterior surface, um, and call that in. Um, and it, again, it's not causing any damage to the log. It's not causing any damage to the finish, really. Um, but you're demonstrating that there is a problem with the finish and the finish needs to be re redone. Um, I also use a probing tool. Uh, actually, this tool here, uh, I picked up at Inspection World this past year. Uh, it comes with multiple heads. Uh, and I cannot remember the name of this. If you, if you guys can remember the name, oh, it's called the Prober. I actually wrote it down. Um, the prober, it, it's actually, it has a screw in on the back uh, that you can extend or put an extension pole on that. Uh, it comes with multiple tips, but this is a great tool that I use now. I used to use an ice pick. Um, this is a great tool to, to see if there's any rot. And again, when I do a log home inspection, I'm very, very careful not to cause any damage to the log home during the inspection. I wanna leave that log home basically the way I found it during the inspection, but 
I have to protect my client. And that's the first and, and foremost responsibility of the inspector here is to protect your client and, and let them know any potential rot issues. So this is something that, that I use um, and, um, and, I, and I use the back of that screwdriver or prober uh, and, and, I, and I tap on the wood itself. Um, and you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna listen for a nice dip sound and that's healthy log. If you hear a dull kind of rotten sound, then you know that there might be some rot that's underneath the surface of that log and you wanna evaluate further. Um, again, concentrate the vast majority of your time with this prober or tapping on the log end. Um, this prober here is, I think it's only about maybe six or seven inches long, maybe maybe a little bit longer than that. I do have an extra long screwdriver that I picked up from Lowe's um, that will get into hard to reach areas or, or kind of probe a, a little bit deeper. Um, so you might want to, whatever works good for you that is that you use on your normal home inspections that may work just fine here. Um, I use a spray bottle as well. So this is just normal water that I have in a spray bottle and I spray the sides of the log home. So anywhere where I, that, I'm, that I think that there may be an issue uh, with the finish, the sealant of the wood on the exterior of the log, so I'll spray that. And so anybody that's ever seen uh, water hit wood, the water will tend to soak right in. So it won't do that if the sealant and um, the finish is in good operation order. So it'll just bead right up, that water will just bead right up. So it's a great way to um, to show your client not only in person but also in your inspection report that hey the sealant has failed the finish has failed it's weathered it needs to be redone um, so this is a, a, a quick way to do it um, it's what I do uh, and uh, it's quick it's easy and it's um, it, it's a great way to show your client I love it uh, compass. Now, this is actually my military compass. I would not suggest using this compass because this compass has tritium in it, um, and, and it's very, very expensive. I think this compass here is about $200. Um, I use it because, hey, um, the government gave it to me, so taxpayers' money at work. Um, but most smartphones have a compass in it, and they're pretty well, they're pretty accurate. Um, uh, depending on uh, the the manufacturer of the of the of the, uh, the phone, I use an iPhone on my inspections. Um, it's pretty accurate. It's not as accurate as this, um, but you don't necessarily need to be very very accurate. So when I when I uh, get a contract to inspect a log home, um, I get the address and then I do a little bit of weather history in that area. So I want to know exactly where the weather is going to be uh, hitting the house more often. Uh, where most of the storms originate from either west to east or east to west or uh, south to north, wherever that is. So I get a little bit of history on the house before I arrive on, on, the, on the property. And then I stand at the house and I get a quick reference of how the house is sitting. So once I get a quick reference with this compass of where the house is sitting, I already know where, the, where most of the storms are originating, then I'm going to concentrate more, more time on that particular side of the home. And Chances are the homeowner has not kept up with it, their annual yearly maintenance on a log home. It's yearly maintenance. Um, if they haven't kept up, most of them haven't with their yearly maintenance, you're going to find some issue with moisture um, in those areas. Um, here are some great online resources that I use. Um, permachink.com is a great one. They're going to cover um, home maintenance. They actually have a YouTube channel as well. Um, your log home maintenance, including caulking, chinking, sealant, finish, finishes. Um, uh, anytime that I have an issue and it's hard to explain to the client, that, let's say they're a computer programmer and they have nothing about this, but they're buying a log home that requires annual maintenance, I send them to permachink.com or I even write it in the report. Um, and I do let them know I don't get any kickback or anything for, for sending them to that website. It's just a great, a great uh, company for any resources regarding log homes. Um, NaturalLogHomes.com is another resource that I, that I use for, um, for my own personal resource um, research. Um, and, uh, and also I give that as well to my, my clients. 
So that covers basic tools. So that's that's actually the end of the presentation. So uh, what I want to do is uh, exit out of that, and I want to I'm I'm praying that you guys can hear this. Um, Sean, stop it. Stop me really quick if you can't hear this. Um, remember that we were talking about um, how much time do we have? 2116. So remember we were talking about why I use a level. Um, this little video. This is my YouTube channel. Um, and this is a log home that I inspected maybe a, a month or two ago. Um, I do a lot of these things, so they kind of blend in. Um, but let me show you kind of what I was looking at here. And this will kind of give an example of what you should be looking for and why there is movement in a load-bearing wall. Hey, Bronson, real quick. Before, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're not hearing it. I don't think we heard any audio. The reason I interrupted was there was a, um, a question came in there. I was going to suggest that we address that real quickly before you – show the video. Yeah. Um, somebody's wanting to know about how to deal with checking. He was suggesting that, that, that you would caulk it. I know that you you talked about the you know upward facing checks and whatnot. You know, how, how do you deal with those things before they turn into rot? Keep them from dropping water. You still with me? I'm still with you. I got you. I'm having some audio difficulty. Sorry. Okay. I'm trying to fix my uh, audio so that you guys can hear the the sound. Okay, say say that again. About dealing with how do you deal with checks? You know, you you talked about the the, the damage caused by the water trapped in them, but but how do you you know do you caulk them or what? So that was in the I think that was in the first half of the presentation. So um, or the first uh, half uh, last couple months ago presentation. Depends on how big the check is, the crack in it, um, and where it's facing. So um, where it's facing on the log itself. Uh, if it's a round log outside and you have an upward facing check, so the check itself is upward facing and you can actually see down into the crack, the check itself, um, that's where you're going to want to pay more attention to it. Now, how to fix those? Um, there is uh, there is a, a, a resin caulk that you can put in that. Uh, a lot of people that don't know what they're doing will just put standard caulk in there. One, it stands out like a sore thumb, but two, it expands and contracts at a different rate than the log and it will open right back up. Most checks are very, very common and you don't have to deal with them at all. Uh, most, uh, most of these uh, log home contractors that do the repairs, they look at it at a half an inch or greater. And so if it's a half an inch, they're gonna look at it a little, a, a, a little longer um, if it's greater than a half an inch, then they're actually going to fill that crack. They're going to fill that check. Um, Permachink actually makes a caulk that's that's designed for that. I hope they still do. They used to, and it was a really, really good uh, caulk for this, and it was actually, actually able to expand and contract in, in the log as the log expands and contracts through uh, thermal expansion during the day and night. Um, that's basically, I mean, there's not a whole lot you do with checks unless the checks are causing further issues. Water's getting in it. Now, downward facing checks in the log in, um, let me see if I can, let's exit out of this. Um, I got too many things going on here. <laughs> yeah, let's, too. let's, too. let's yeah. Um, so let's pull, there we go. There we go. All right, so, um, so this is a downward facing check. I hope you guys can see that. This is yeah, a downward facing check. And so a downward facing check isn't as egregious as an upward facing check because water isn't gonna get into that crack and stay in that crack. It's gonna drain right out. So this is a, a check that has, um, that's in the center of the wall. This is a 1700s house. Um, and that check there is very, very common. You see those splits. A lot of people look at that and they say, oh, there's some structural defects or some structural movement. It really isn't. Um, it does go deep. And so you're gonna wanna probe those areas and, and see if there's any rot in those areas. I actually put my moisture meter with the probes in it um, to see what's inside of there uh, and if any moisture is retaining. Um, you're really not going to do a whole lot with that, especially historic log homes. You're not going to you're not going to try to ruin the the historical integrity or look of the home for that. 
had some crack chinking that needs to be dealt with. Um, uh, let's dovetail, let's see if I can get to, okay, upward facing checks. So this is a bigger problem, uh, especially with logins and upward facing checks there. So water will actually get into that tongue and groove, into that check and go to the center of the log, which is the most vulnerable part of the log. And that's the area of the log that rots the, the quickest uh, versus the exterior of the log. Um, and so that's where you're gonna wanna go and, and use your probe, use your moisture meter. Um, and those are the areas, so that area actually needs to be caulked. Even though they've done a really, really good job with maintenance on the log ends there, you can see it's sealed up nicely. They still need to caulk that check. So a good expandable caulk by Permachink or another uh, manufacturer that makes the, that exterior, good exterior grade caulk, um, you, they're gonna wanna do that. And I generally tell my clients, skimp on money when it comes to paint and sealants and caulks on the inside and use the more expensive caulk sealants and, and, and name brands on the exterior of the home. And that's with any stick built home. Um, and this is an example of moisture. I don't know if we can go back, but anyways, this is, is an example of moisture at the butt ends. Um, and they use just regular store-bought caulk on the inside of the home expecting that was going to do the trick when the moisture is coming from the outside you address it from the outside you never address moisture on the inside of the home uh, with caulk on a log home and expect that to do the trick yeah, all you're doing is trapping the water in the wall that's exactly all that's all you're doing is trapping it right in those areas and it's going to rot very quickly and especially this rubberized um, nonsense caulk that they put you, you know, you're not you're not doing anything good here so Bronson, wow. you talked about you talked earlier about um, replacing logs in walls. Mm -hmm. uh, is is there a different procedure for uh, dealing more complicated issues like gable ends? Is there a more uh, difficult process to replace those logs? It is more difficult um, because they end up having to uh, they have to jack up that area. If it's it depends on how extensive the rod is um, in replacing those logs. It that tells you how much they have to jack up. Um, I've seen a whole gable end have to be jacked up or that whole that whole wall have to be jacked up and support it from um, both sides, inside and outside, in order to replace those logs. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. So how often do you think um, should people be sealing the exteriors, you know, log, log exteriors? How often Great. should they seal? Yeah, great question. Um, it depends on where, if you have a southern facing or a western facing. So an area of the of the house that receives more sunlight, um, you're going to want to look at those areas. And those are going to be probably, you're going to want to look at them every year versus the shaded area. So if you have a good overhang soffit over a log and you see that it's, it's, it's shaded most of the time, that's generally not going to receive a whole lot of, of, of care, annual maintenance, maybe once every five years. But those areas that receive a, a, a lot of, of sunlight, a lot of wind, um, a lot of rain, those are going to be basically every year. So do you have any specific material that you recommend a sealant? Um, well, it depends on the log itself. It depends on um, the type of log, uh, the type of wood. Um, and this, the, the, um, the species of wood. So type of log versus round, square, uh, the profile of the log and the species of the log. Um, again, Permachink has all of that there. I would, I, I tell my clients to kind of stay away from painting a log home. Um, you want, if you want a color, they use, they have stains and sealants. Um, that have a, uh, a, a pigment in those so you can get a color there. Once you do that color, you can't go back though. Um, in the past, I've used a product called Sickens, um, and I believe it's made by Sherwin Williams. I'll have to go back and, and, and really do some research on that. That's, that was a product that was, that was used by an old um, Amish log home guy that was or a Mennonite log home guy that was around my area that that's what he swore by and it actually did quite well it's pretty expensive um, I think for a five gallon bucket it was like maybe 300 bucks for a five gallon bucket wow. uh, but you didn't have to apply it every year um, it lasted 
basically five years, even in the areas that were that were uh, had wind driven rain and tons of sunlight. It lasted a good long while, but it was more expensive. Yeah. So, so Mark is Mark's asking you to fo to follow up a little bit more on the gable ends. He's talking about you know is there a difference whether it's you know bowed in or bowed out. Um. So how about how about I um go to that video? Okay. Um. I think that might answer some questions. And there's some other there are some more videos. If you go back to this, um, we'll say no thanks. If you go back in, if you want to learn more about log homes. Go back and just watch some of these videos on YouTube and, and um, this actually this particular house has a, a, a wall that is bowed outward and I discussed why it's it's bowing outward. Um, let me know if you can't hear it. Expecting a long house that was built in 1986. So it's an older kit style home and I wanted to show you some of the defects that I find on these older kit style homes because the regulations were not really in place in the 80s where they are now or even before then. Um, but one thing that I want to show you guys is this great room. Let's see, I'll turn the camera around. And so we have this gigantic great room here. We've got um, board matten siding here. And then the log itself starts here. We've got logs on both ends. And you have the rafters that go up to the roof board there. And you have some rafter ties there. And so these rafter ties were put in place to kind of alleviate some of the stress that the rafters put on the, the load bearing walls, which are the front and rear of the, of the house. And so these logs here um, are, are nice and plumb until I get to this, this front entry door and this side here. And so uh, one thing on your inspections that you guys want to try to do is go right to the front entry door. And I'm just going to open the door and the door is going to close by itself and it doesn't have self closing hinges just so you guys know, but a door closed by itself, which means that the, the outside wall here, this wall is leaning out. So this load bearing wall here with this opening with it in the door, which is a natural weak point in a load in a, a log wall here, it's leaning out. And the reason is because They've, they've created rafter ties on all the other rafters and they left them off on these two here. Um, and I see this quite often. I don't know why they left them off because they, they visibly have room here to do that. But when you leave off the rafter ties, this creates a load that is not, that it's not designed for. So the, the load and the weight of the roof that's coming down here, is now pushing on the rafters out here, which is now pushing this exterior wall out. And so if you go up to the ridge board, and we'll go upstairs to the loft. So we go up to the ridge board, you can clearly see there's a gap in the separation between this rafter and the ridge board. And that in the ridge board. And so, um, because there's no ramp ties here, this is allowed to move just due to the weight and gravity of the roof. And it's actually pushing all the way down to this load bearing wall here, which is the log wall, which is allowing this front entry door to, to close shut on its own, which is indicating movement, a, a outwardly movement in this wall here. Well, um, so that's that's kind of um, that's kind of what I'm looking for. And even though I'm seeing a little bit of movement there, that's causing the door to shut. Um, it's not enough movement to to signify that it's a major structural defect. So basically, all they need to do is put some rafter ties in. Um, they're really not going to correct the the movement, the hourly movement of that that load bearing wall there. Um, and so you're not going to try to reverse that when you repair this, uh, but you're going to try to alleviate the stress that's that's currently being um, pushed on that wall. Uh, but that's one of the things that that I look for. Um, if it's gone beyond, um, if it's gone, I think the last engineer I talked to on on one of these logs, uh, log homes, 
he said if it's gone beyond eight inches, so eight inches from top to bottom of movement, um, outwardly movement, um, then it's then that's deemed a structural defect and they have to re-engineer. And a lot of times it's plating the front and plating the back and binding all of that together with some all thread. Um, I hope that answered your question a little bit. There's so much involved when it comes to movement from an inward movement or an outward movement. Uh, most of the time you're going to see an outwardly movement. But I think that's I think that's all the time we have. It's already 2131. Um, so I believe that's all the time we have. I greatly appreciate you guys uh, spending the spending the night with me and um, and let me teach you about one of my love affairs and in, in home inspections and that's log homes.